They say small business is the backbone of America. So what's the best way to support a small business? It is to learn more about them and share with your family and friends. We interview founders from across the world who have started and scaled their business through the ups and downs, long hours, and the rewards that come from sacrificing their time to build their business. Welcome to First to Arrive, Last to Leave, The Journey of an Entrepreneur. Welcome to another episode of First to Arrive, Last to Leave. We have Ashley Wakoff here of Pretty Penny. Ashley, welcome. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, she's my cohort. What are we? 22. 22. Yeah. But like, what are we? Cohort part, <laughs> oh. um, cohort friends or something. I don't know. Yeah. We went through the 10K together. So, and Ashley, I've, you've got a great story of you were doing this part time. You were running a part and then took the leap. So can you tell us to start off Pretty Penny, the the story behind it, what made you say, you know what, I'm going to do some side stuff here, and then, you know what, I'm ready to take this on my own. Yeah, it really started when I was working a nine to five. I was an accountant for a company, and it was a startup. It was a lot of fun. It was kind of crazy. There was a lot going on, but I enjoyed it, but I just craved control over my own life, and I just kept daydreaming about what would it look like if I started my own company? What would it look like if I could create my own schedule and have financial freedom and freedom over my schedule and and be able to travel whenever I wanted and and create a work atmosphere that was one I would want to work in and hire people. I just kept thinking about it and kept thinking about it. And so I literally was sitting in my car on my lunch break one day, just eating lunch in my car because I kind of needed a break from, you know, the office, as we do sometimes, and just decided I have to take the next step. Whatever that looks like, I just have to take some little baby step to get me closer to this thing I keep thinking about. And I filed for my LLC in the car. I decided on a name right then and there. And like literally on my phone, I'm like trying to zoom in and and file for my LLC indexes. And that was just the next step. And from then it was just little baby steps, baby steps until about 10 months from that date is when I left my job and went full time in Pretty Penny. Okay, I didn't know about the phone. How did you? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's amazing. <laughs> how did you go about that? Because I think a lot of people think, well, I don't know how to find clients. I don't know. Like, where were your first steps in saying, okay, I'm working for this company, but I'm going to go find clients outside of it? Yeah. So I grew up in a family of entrepreneurs. Um, my parents are entrepreneurs. My step parents are entrepreneurs. Like, everyone in my family has owned a business. And my mom has always said, friends buy from friends. And so from a very, very early stage, I just always thought if I just put the word out there, maybe there's someone in my network or a family friend or a family member that has a business that needs some help. So that was really how it started was I just kind of started like texting some family and friends and being like, hey, I can do QuickBooks training or or I can, you know, these are the things that I can do. And so people started kind of having me come out to their offices and do little things. I was doing that on nights and weekends. And it was about a year a little over a year into my business was when the pandemic hit and that's when i realized that all of my business had come from referrals i didn't have a website i didn't have a social media presence i don't even think i had business cards or like a pamphlet and i was like oh now i gotta figure out this sales thing (laughs) this is the next step so what was it like figuring out the sales thing yeah (laughs) man it was so new to me like i'm a numbers person so accounting i understood the sales side of things other than just having conversations with people was really foreign to me like how to actually close a deal or how to go out and find clients i didn't want to just start calling random businesses although i thought about it um so i decided i was going to figure out how to build a website and that was probably one of the hardest things I've ever done (laughs) looking back. There's been some other harder things along the way, but it was so difficult. I was trying to YouTube and just listening to these people that I could not understand trying to describe how to build a WordPress website. (laughs) (laughs) Nearly impossible. Um, But I figured it out. I built a website and then an opportunity came across my screen somewhere to do this coaching course. It was a 90 day coaching program and it was all about sales and marketing on social media and just sales and marketing in general. And it was expensive for me at the time, but I did it. And it was one of the better decisions I've made. I learned a ton doing that. Awesome. Yeah. And that was um, like just a a class that you took or learning how to actually teach a course? It was a class I took on how to market myself. So it was like how to create a social media presence. So my business now is my sales are almost solely generated from social media. And which is interesting for an accounting firm. Yeah. (laughs) Um, and it was, it taught me a lot about how to 
become a leader in the industry, how to build that know, like, and trust, how to have confidence in the sales process, all kind of via social media, but I learned a lot about myself along the way. And that's really cool because it, when I'm thinking about it, I'm like, gosh, every entrepreneur, we're, we're always like, we have to wear many hats. Yeah. And so you found like a niche that was, we're, we're ready to take that hat off and hand it to someone else. Like I was ready to do that like week one and obviously that was not an option. <laughs> but, you know, going through the program taught me about knowing my numbers and stuff. What did the program, like, what did you, what was your takeaway from the program? I think it was on like a grander scale, it was that every business, whether they look like they have it together or not, is yeah. learning something, <laughs> right? Like we, it just sometimes can seem like, oh, well, they all have it figured out. So there's something I'm missing or there's like this key thing. I just need to learn that and then I'll have it figured out. And I learned not everyone has it. They might not be learning the same thing that I'm trying to learn, but everyone's got something they're trying to figure out, trying to learn. And it's just a process. So I think on a grand scale, that was the biggest thing. Uh, that's awesome. So I want to go back because to your point of wearing hats and Courtney had texted me earlier this week talking about people interested in starting a business, but they're like, okay, well, I don't want to do this part or I don't want to do that part. Yeah. You're a numbers girl and we can like put you in a stereotype bucket. You probably don't love sales and marketing, right? That's right. not your thing. So you're in a, a situation of a business to say, okay, I either I need to buck up and learn or you know hire somebody to do this. Has that always been something you've been willing to do or did you really have to make a mindset shift? Like talk through that process of, yeah. okay, this isn't my, this isn't my thing, but I need to jump in and do this or I'm not going to be able to do my thing much longer. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I think so much of business and what we do is mindset shifts. Like it's just, that's how we make it through somehow. Yeah. Um, but early on, I knew I, I'm, I'm a very like cheesy person. I'm bubbly. I'm not really your typical accountant. And I was trying to put myself in the box of your typical accountant. Mm. And so when I was first creating like my website and what my presence was going to look like, I was looking at other accounting firms that looked very formal, very dressy, very what you would expect from an accounting firm. And so I started kind of creating things around that. And it was really hard. And I think I finally realized that it was so hard because it wasn't me. And it took me some time to give myself permission to just be like myself, be silly, be lighthearted, um, be cheesy and sell in that way because it was so much more authentic to who I was. And that actually made sales and marketing so much easier. So to me, that was more of the mindset shift was like, if I could just get over the hump of like, I thought people were going to judge me if it didn't look super formal or think it wasn't legit. But you know what? Doing that opens a door to people who, like for me, like I would probably not go to a traditional accounting firm because I'm going to, yeah. maybe they're going to make me feel like I don't know what I'm talking about right. or it is too dressy. Yeah. I need to be a little, you know, we need to joke about the fact that maybe I shouldn't have spent that, you know, expensed that jacket <laughs> exactly. or whatever, you know, and it being able to ha be comfortable talking about it because I know as a woman and one, you know, having to assess my numbers we can often be put in a box that we're, we don't know what we're talking about yeah. and like just you talking about it I'm like can you look at my books like, I wanna, <laughs> like can you tell me about it I'm excited like you can slap me on the wrist and say that's not what you should be doing I'm like right. okay you know but because you're yeah. very personable and that's really neat that you were able to leverage that and yeah. like you said we can have fun with it right yeah. like we can talk about the rules and what we need to do in a way that doesn't have to be intimidating right <laughs> And I always felt like when I would talk to people about going to visit their accountant, it was like, if you can think back when you were in school, if you ever got called down to the principal's office, people would feel that way driving to their accountant's office. Like, they're going to get mad at me. It's going to yeah. be something that I did wrong. They're going to think I'm stupid. Yeah. That's always, they're going to talk yeah. down to me. Yeah. Yes. Oh, I've had a couple of those experiences. <laughs> well, and I've always, I know I've told you this before, too, actually, like giving somebody over your numbers it's like standing there naked in yes. front of them like here is oh. me all of me good and bad me like here it is yep. and it's intimidating and so yeah. to bring that down a level to say not even like you're stupid but okay you're doing well you're not doing well because you know so many of us just don't know where we stand in the grand scheme of things and we yeah. always think we're failing right or yep. we're doing it wrong or something so being comfortable with that is a huge huge piece to it it's extremely vulnerable. And I tell my employees now, our clients are trusting us, not just with the numbers, right? Not just with their bank accounts, with their passwords, which is a massive trust in, in and of itself, right? Yeah. You're really handing over access to a lot of things. 
But to me, that's like the bare minimum. They're really trusting us with their vulnerability of like getting down in the dirty of like, you're going to see where I spend my money and how I spend it. Mm -hmm. And they need to trust us that we're not going to judge them for that. We're not going to reprimand them for that. It's just this is what's going to be best for your business. So let's figure out how to make it work within what you want to do. I love it. Yeah, Yeah. that's that's amazing. So you said you came from a family of entrepreneurs. Do you think that shaped you to want to be an entrepreneur? Yeah, it's kind of a joke in my family because even (laughs) from the time I was a little kid and they would be like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I would always just say, I want to work in one of those really tall buildings with the big windows and I want to have an assistant. Like that was my dream. (laughs) (laughs) Not like a dancer or firefighter. I don't know. Yeah. Um, So I think from a young age, I always knew I probably would want to own a business of my own in some capacity. I just always thought it would be when I was like way more grown up or prepared. (laughs) Now I'm realizing I don't know if that part ever would have come. So I'm glad mm-hmm. that I really just took the leap into into doing it. But it is really nice having them, having family members that have been entrepreneurs or are them now because they have a lot of advice that's very relatable to what I'm doing. Yeah. 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 What was the leap like? Because you did, you did it part-time for a while, right? Yeah. You were doing it. It was your side gig, side hustle. So talk through that moment. I know we've talked about this before, but the okay, now, now I'm ready. And I know like you've talked about the time you were able to donate or not donate, but work on your business, stuff like that. Yeah. Where was that shift at? Like where, and, and what did you also have to change in, within you to say, I'm ready to go on my own fully? It was terrifying if I'm being honest. <laughs> no, please be honest. <laughs> yeah. We it love was, honesty. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it was scary. I mean, having a job and a paycheck is very comforting, right? Yeah. Like that's definitely a safety net. And I wasn't in a position where someone else was going to pay my bills, right? Like I had to be able to make the money to pay all the things that I had. And I've got student loans from school. And so I really had to be able to figure that out. And so I kind of had a plan. I was like, okay, well, all the money, once I started really bringing on clients, I just was kind of putting that money aside into a savings account. And I decided if I can get to a certain amount of money in that savings account that could carry me, I think it was three months carry me three months. I was like, I can figure out how to make it work in three months. And if I can't, I will go be a waitress or do whatever I need to do to make money. Like I can go find a job. Um, and I think I decided, I think I decided the date that I was going to officially let them know. And I was going to, you know, leave and go do my own thing. And I think I ended up leaving like a month and a half early because I was so ready. And I just had decided I trusted myself enough that I would figure it out. Like I would find the clients, I would make it work. And I ended up going to my employer and asking them if they would stay on as a client. And I remember that being sort of a make or break. Like I would have been able to figure it out, but that would have been really what helped me be successful kind of in this jumping the boat. And they said yes, and that was huge, that they decided to stay on as a client of mine. And I think it really was just the trust in myself, just having to decide that, like, because of course all my friends and family were like, you're doing what? Yeah. Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah. Uh, What were some of like the biggest growing pains for you? Or was it all roses? Has it just yeah, been? Oh, like, it's yeah. been all roses. Okay, yeah. no, right, yeah. skip that. There's okay. been no <laughs> growing pains. There's been no growing pains. Um, people hiring yeah. has been, and I, I've, I was never in a job before where I managed people. Mm. And so it was not only figuring out how to hire the right people, how to train the right people, how to motivate the right people, but also just how to manage people and what that looked like. Um, it was a huge learning curve for me. It still is. I feel like I'm still learning with every single hire what it looks like. And I think the hardest part is that I put a lot of pressure on myself to create a really great workspace. You know, I want to have a, a work atmosphere where employees are excited to show up every day. Well, every day is a little too optimistic. So maybe like yeah. 95% <laughs> of the time, right? Um, but I want them to show up and be excited to work and be motivated and enjoy what they do. And that's not always easy, right? right? The work isn't always fun. So kind of finding that balance, but just figuring out how to manage people because I'd never done it before, figuring out how to give good feedback. Mm -hmm. I'm not a very, um, I don't like to really get into tough conversations. So that's been tough too. So I'm curious, like from hiring employee number one to hiring now, I don't, how many do you, how many are you up to? Four and one intern. Four and one intern. So hiring employee number one to hiring number four 
what changed in that process for you as you learned? Yeah, so much. It's funny now because whenever I talk to people who are kind of on the about to hire their first employee, mm -hmm. there's a lot of nerves that go into that. At least there was for me. It was like, okay, not only now am I supporting myself, but I'm also going to be supporting somebody else. And that was huge. So I was very nervous. So I started out, I hired someone on a contract position and I was like, just going to do like maybe five, 10 hours a week. And within, I think two months, she was a full-time employee. And I think going through that, I realized now whenever anybody asks me about it, like, oh, should I hire? Should I wait? And I'm like, you will find the work to support that person as soon as you have some work off of your plate. Yeah. And I think we have this huge mindset shift when we know we have to support other people of I have to figure out how to make this work. So it almost motivated me to go out and find clients and do more of the sales and marketing piece to bring new clients in. And it's really snowballed from there. My first hire, it was a wonderful hire. She's still with me. She was someone that I knew and it has been the best decision that I ever made. Um, she knows like all the ins and outs of my business. The second hire did not work out. And so I learned a lot from that hire. I hired way too quick mm. and she was only with me for like 60 days, I think. So it wasn't too long, but I realized at that point that I did not have core values. And so I was not hiring based on core values. Mm -hmm. I was just like, I like this girl, she'll work, it'll, it'll fit, we'll make it work. Um, and so now I hire based on core values. I've really defined what those look like. I figured out how to ask questions that are related to core values. That's something we talked a lot about in the Goldman Sachs program. The yep. whole hiring portion of it was really helpful for me, um, the people part. Yeah. But asking the right questions and trying to figure out who someone really is and if they fit in with our core values has really changed how I've hired. I'm so curious, um, what are your core values? Yeah, <laughs> so they're growth-minded. I really like working with clients and working with people, like anyone on my team who's growth-minded, they're wanting to learn, they're wanting to find new ways of doing things. Mm -hmm. Resourceful, people who are just able to figure out problems, right? I can really, it's not a bad thing to ask questions, but, but to really figure out problems. Um, trustworthy, where grace is one of them. We're really gracious with people and um, ki kindness, and that just kind of goes in with grace. But it's really just about being resourceful, growth-minded, and gracious with people. Yeah, I really do believe that core values and having those words in place really helps you ask the intelligent questions because that yeah. was a big shift for me too. What's like your favorite question to ask yeah. a new hire? Ooh, that's a good question. <laughs> I always like to learn like what about questions around the growth minded core value that we have. So like what they've learned recently, what they're interested in, even outside of accounting. Um, and so sometimes I'll talk to people that have you know, a side hustle of their own, something that they're passionate about. And I think that's really fascinating or something that they're trying to learn. Like, you know, I, one of my employees, her and her husband do woodworking. And I think that that's just fascinating. So people who are just interested in learning new things and trying new things. And I'm always trying to pull that out. I know we don't want to get too personal in interviews, but I, I do want to learn a little bit about like, what do they do in their free time or what do they enjoy doing? Right. Because I think that can tell you a lot about a person. Absolutely. Yeah, if they're yeah. sitting on Netflix all day. And there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. But yeah, you want some sort of hobby and purpose outside of work. Yeah, yeah. just what they're interested in. Yeah. Well, then it also gives you a foundation to support them outside of them yes. supporting you as an employee, which I think yeah. is pretty cool. Yeah. So going back to the leader, like you've talked about changing, how has leader Ashley employee number one changed from leader Ashley to number four? Like, how have you learned to give that feedback? How have you learned to have the difficult conversations to help in this perspective of growth, not just criticism, right? Yeah. <laughs> I put on the owner of Pretty Penny hat sometimes, and I just pretend it's not me. I'm like, this is a different person. <laughs> You're Sasha Fierce. Yes, yes. I'm like, she has to have this hard conversation. So I literally will just be like, OK, <laughs> and scene. Here we go. Like I've got this is just what I have to do. And honestly, it's helped. And I think over time, those, you know, they're two people. They're just me, obviously, have meshed. And I've learned how to have those those better conversations. But I still, to this day, do that. If I have to have a tough client conversation or a tough employee conversation before, I will literally just be like, this is an Ashley. This is the owner of Pretty Penny. She has to have this conversation. We can do this. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I, I love that. I'm going to use it. What <laughs> does your do. workspace look like? Oh, I love that yeah. question. Um, 
so I work out of my home awesome. and my fiance and I bought a house last year and a big part was I wanted to have a, a whole room that was just my office before we lived here I officed out of our guest room mm. and I really needed like a whole full space um, and then it was just a white room and that was not very motivating mm -hmm. so recently I painted it green mm -hmm. and it's really cozy in there there's like a little chair I've got books in there I have a TV just in case I need to put on a little something in the background I usually like candles and I'm like a big lighting person so I'll have like low lights on I'm just a very much like want it to be a cozy and inviting space because mm -hmm. that makes me feel comfortable whenever I step in there for the day and is your staff work with you they're completely remote wow yeah that's fantastic yeah so they're all completely remote so they'll I do the same sometimes we'll pop into office or to coffee shops or things like that um, but we do a lot of zoom calls yeah so can you talk about because a lot of people are facing well they've kind of had to get used to it by this point mm -hmm. but what would you say you do really well and then what could you improve on the leading a team from a remote perspective? Yeah, great question. I think I'm going to start with the latter. I think one of the hardest parts about leading a team in a virtual atmosphere is the connection piece, mm. right? Like in an office space, there's a lot of casual conversations that happen. You learn about each other's families. You learn about what they do in their free time or what they did or what they did over the weekend or what they're interested in or something they're looking forward to or a struggle that they're having even. And there's bonding that happens without the owner present, right? Like they're just, there's a lot of connection in a physical office space. That's a little bit harder, or at least it has been for me, harder to foster in a virtual space. And so we've done some different things to um, really try to create that connection between, between my employees. Um, have them work on client work together, work on different projects together so that they can get to know each other a little bit better. So I think that that's helped. I always feel like something I want to do is hold space for them whenever they need it. So I do think that that's something I do well. I've got one-on-ones with my team every week and we also do a team meeting so that everyone can see each other's face and we can talk and, and try to get to know each other a little bit better. Um, but I really try to make sure that if they need me, I'm holding space for them and that time is for them, not always for me to give them more work or another project or whatever that looks like, but really to find out what are, what are you going through? What's going on outside of work? Is that, you know, is there anything, any way I can support you? Um, so yeah. I, I love that concept of like virtual meetings just because I also feel like it gives you time or opportunity to save a little space for yourself because yeah. if someone's constantly knocking on your door or I know that I have to shut my door and I have to have some sort of noise happening in office because if people walk by, I'm just, I'm easily yeah. distracted. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we have a couple virtual employees and it's really fun. Yeah. It's definitely different. It's definitely an adjustment. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. But yeah. that's all you've known too. It's all from, I've known. Yeah. Yeah. It's really all I've known. And I knew when I first started hiring, I wanted to keep things virtual if I could. And I've been really glad that I have. It's allowed me, I think, to hire different people outside of just this area. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just a it's just a different way of doing things and keeping people motivated. Yeah. So like what outside of the um, hiring portion of the 10 KSB program, what was something like what was like one of the things that you had like an aha moment? Ooh. Um. That's a good question. I think, so in the in the program, we had that day where we had to do the pitch. Mm -hmm. Ashley won our pitch, by the way. I was Keep terrified on. to do <laughs> <No>. the pitch. <laughs> and I think by doing well in the pitch, I learned more about myself. And even just creating the pitch, like I learned, now I feel like I'm a lot better about talking about my business as a whole. Mm -hmm. I deal with a ton of imposter syndrome and just trying to figure out how to combat that. And then I think every new level, there's a new devil, right? So like every time I, my business grows, it's a different kind of imposter syndrome. It's like, how am I here? How did I even get here? <laughs> how do I have these employees and all these clients that are counting on me, you know? And so I think going through the practice of pitching my services and really learning like how to talk about my business in a way that investors or um you know people outside of just small businesses would understand gave me more confidence in my own business so i learned a lot through that process there was so many golden nuggets just all through yeah. the program in and of itself yeah but i really feel like it was like the in-between stuff that i learned about myself and learned about what other businesses were going through that really helped and in that sense so 
because you've bootstrapped everything up to this point, oh, yeah. correct? Yeah. So I'm curious to, and you've been very conservative in how you hire, bringing on the clients. Yeah. Going through that program and then doing the pitch, did it change your perspective of thinking bigger? Because I'll be honest with you, it's I have been A, terrified to bring on investors from an A, thinking bigger perspective, and B, terrified of giving up my baby to someone and being held accountable yeah. by someone else. Like, yeah having them entrusting me on something like I'm investing in you I better see this return yeah I don't know if you go through that but how did that change your perspective on well maybe it would make sense to get a ten thousand dollar line of credit or a fifty thousand you know and I'm talking smaller numbers compared to what a lot of people go I'd right. love to know how if that perspective changed for you it did going into the program I would have I mean I never even considered no. taking any money <laughs> Even if the thought came up, I was like, absolutely not. No, like, you know, this, I'm going to make it work. I will figure it out. Um, I have a lot of student loans from school. And so I think there's also some scarcity money mindset, which has, I've worked on that for a long time, but there still is some of that there. But I'm like, well, I have this debt over here. There's no way I'm going to add it over here. And I think going through the program, it really showed me that, taking on debt is what can allow you to grow to where you want to go yeah. because it's <laughs> nearly impossible to do that on your own. Yeah. Well, yeah. And then once you actually start talking about it with other people, cause you know, that you don't talk about it with family or friends in general, just no. because they, you know, it's, they're asking you how much money you're making, all that stuff. They'd start yeah. to become part of the conversation. But when you start talking to entrepreneurs about it and you're like, you took a how much loan yeah. and it's like, okay. And they were able to leverage that for growth. Right. And yep. that's, that was, some fascinating stuff we've heard recently from other people we've interviewed. I was like, I'm sorry, what was that number? <laughs> <laughs> well, and what's terrifying to me too is like, I, there was that whole, ex, like the example, the, the case study where like, I think she made like toothbrushes or something. I don't mm -hmm. know if you remember that one. Yeah. But like she's doing bad and so she keeps borrowing money and then yes. she's doing, and it's not doing, and so she keeps borrowing money. That story is terrifying to yeah. me. Like to have the confidence to say, we're not doing well right now, so I'm going to take out more money. And I know yeah. so many entrepreneurs do that, and I just don't think that way. Like I'm, I definitely am working on scarcity issues too. But I'm like, no, 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 no. Like we got to figure out, we got to make what's working here work. Because yeah. mm -hmm. is this really ha like? It's just, it's, it's tremendous to me. I wish I did have more of that mindset. And I, and I know, like I said, I know you think more conservatively too. But it did help me think a little differently. I don't think I'm making <laughs> toothbrushes <laughs> anytime soon, but like that whole story, like I'm like having anxiety, like, and she did what? She took out more? <laughs> Why? Why would she do that? It's so funny because I do think that that story semi-traumatized me too, <laughs> because I'm like, at what point do you stop? Yes. And I think that is part of the fear is that if you take out money and it doesn't work and you're not able to pay that back, then you are going to have to take out more to start paying that back. And, you know, it, it kind of snowballs. But I think on the flip side of that, I'm a big believer. And when you make an investment, there's something inside of you that is like, I spent this money or mm -hmm. I borrowed this money. Yep. I will do whatever I need to to make it work. And yes. we subconsciously start making decisions that then make it work. Yeah. Right. So I, I really do think that. When it's time, I will. I don't know when that'll be, if it'll be soon or never, maybe. But <laughs> but I do think that when we make big investments like that, we really do, like, something in us, like, kicks on and is like, okay, we're going to do whatever we need to do to make this work. Yeah. I can tell you from experience, that's exactly, we've been there, at multiple, we've been at those crossroads at multiple um, places in our business. Yeah. And one of those being, which we chat a little bit about, they, you know, the first or second week we're talking about exit strategies. And we were so deep in what we were doing. I was like, I only thought an exit strategy was when you were you were failing. You yeah. needed to think about what you're going to be strategic yeah. to get out. And to have, you know, everyone enlighten me on actually what an exit strategy was. I was like, oh, okay, but I'm still, I'm not, I'll, we'll close everything down, pick ourselves up by our bootstraps and we will strap the company and you know, one of us will take a paycheck or what have you and not the other to continue to have opportunities to move forward. I think that's, yeah. you're right, it does kick in. All yeah. of a sudden you're like, oh, okay. We will figure it out. Yeah, we gotta focus. Yeah. I'm really curious 
how excited you were when you went up onto the LLC website and you saw a pretty penny was available. <laughs> Because that's I some was, of the things that would light me up yeah, when, like, a name I love is, like, available. Name. Yeah, you know? available. <laughs> Something I wish that I had done was seen if the website I wanted was available before I filed for the LLC. Because I filed for the LLC, and then I was all in. Um, but I was very excited when I saw that it was available on there. Yeah, because what's your website? It's not the same, is it? No, it's pplcaccounting.com. Oh. And when I created the website, I was still in this mindset of I need it to be professional. Mm. And Pretty Penny is very cheeky. Like, it's very, oh, like, cutesy. So and I was like, no one's going to take me seriously if they're like, oh, my accountant's company name is Pretty Penny. And I really struggled with that mindset. And for some reason, I still went forward with it. And now I'm so glad that I did because it fits me so well. Um, it's so lighthearted and fun and cute, and mm -hmm. that's kind of what we are. And so I feel like it fits so much now. But the website's something I struggle with because it's just, it's still more formal. Yeah. Yeah. Well, is it something that's it. available? Yeah. What I want isn't, but we're kind of making the process to migrate into heyprettypenny.com. Oh. And so we have a landing page there right now, and I think we might slowly migrate my website over to heyprettypenny.com. It's easier right. to say, and it's way cuter it's than, so so fun. than like all the letters. And someone has to type out accounting, and it's not that hard, but there's C's, and there's and a lot of letters like, in there. I bought accounting, I'm yeah. depressed. <laughs> I'm like, oh. like, oh, I forgot we're talking about to accounting. Do taxes. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> But it just goes back to like when you're a small, when you're the owner of a small business, you're having to make these decisions, right? And no one, you don't always have someone else to be like, we should think this through a little deeper. Like mm -hmm. we should really revisit, is this the right decision? Especially in those early stages, it was just me. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So what's next for you? Like what's next for Pretty Penny as you grow? And is it just more employees, more clients, or are there other things happening outside of um, yeah. just a standard, you know, service growth? I'm really interested in being able to serve businesses who are really just getting started. Not everyone can afford an accountant off the bat. Most people can't afford an accountant off the bat, but they still need to be able to understand their finances. True, like I think when we're making decisions in business, most of it is a gut feeling, mm -hmm. but you need to know that the numbers are there to back it because that's what gives you confidence in the decisions that you make. If you know, my gut's telling me to do this, the numbers are also telling me to do this, this is clearly the right decision. Um, and so I think businesses, even at an early stage, need that confidence. They need to be able to understand the numbers in their business. So we're really working on trying to figure out how to serve those people, whether it's in courses or master classes or group coaching programs or things like that. Um, it's been interesting getting people to feel comfortable in a group space to really open up about their financial situation or the questions that they have. But I'm finding more and more people are becoming comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. So we're really playing around with different ways that we can serve people who aren't quite ready for an accountant while we still love serving people who want an accountant as well. That's awesome. Yeah. It's almost like yeah. a fractional CFO for, yeah. for a smaller business like yeah. model. I, I love that. Especially because, like you said, like they're, you're not realizing money coming in and coming out and stuff when you're starting. You're just like, I need to buy this supply. I yes. have it in my account. I'm gonna block, I'm gonna purchase yeah. it. Yeah. So to have someone to lean on and to who's you know you have a great personality, obviously, and the, easily to trust and and get going. I think this is that's a really cool idea to yeah. start with small business. Yeah. And I think in those early stages, so many people are just running off the balance in their bank account, right? Like there's <laughs> money in there. I can afford something. Yes. But then they're like, what else could I afford? Can yeah. I afford to hire someone? Can I afford to pay myself more? What about taxes? You know, there's a lot of questions that go in. Yep. And Google is helpful, but also a rabbit hole that can send you like into a spiral of trying to figure that out. So, yeah. so what would you suggest for a small business? Like when they get to a certain like benchmark um, to hire? Mm, to hire. Mm -hmm. It depends on what they're hiring. Okay. But I think as soon as someone can feel that their plate is starting to get full, you've got to get something off your plate if your plan is to keep growing. So I always like to start with that too. Like what's your goal? Is your goal to just max out what you want to spend your time doing? Mm -hmm. Or is your goal to make more money and really grow this thing? Um, and you just don't want to wait until it's too late to hire because then you're kind of backtracking. You're having to train while also being busy yourself. So I think once you start feeling that pressure of like, okay, my plate is full, like the, it's stressing me out even thinking about what's coming down the road yep. um, to get things off of their plate then. 
What should they have tied up to? Like a lot of people I'm sure are like, well, I'm not on QuickBooks mm. or I'm not doing X or I am still just writing from my bank account. So are you going to like, is this not a good thing to hire you? Like what are the kind of base, basic things they that could make it easier for them? Yeah. I think that when it comes to hiring an accountant, so often people want to get their stuff organized before they hire someone so that whenever they see it, they'll be like, look how organized everything is. It's so pretty. Yeah. I'm awesome. <laughs> I'm so awesome. I've done such a good job keeping this all organized for you. I just need you to do it now. Yeah. And I talk to people so often that have said, I've been planning to do that to get it all organized for like a year and a half. And I just am realizing a year and a half late that I don't have the time and I need you to just come clean up the mess. The thing about accountants is most of us like messes because we can clean it up and then it really is satisfying for us. So. It's good to know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, instant gratification or gratification yes. delayed. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. So I really wouldn't say that there is any pre-qualifier if you're trying to hire, like if, if you're looking for someone to come in and help you with the accounting piece, don't try to feel like you have to have things figured out beforehand because they will help you with all of that and then it's way less stressful on you because most likely the person's going to end up Googling and trying to figure it out. And, and that's a lot of time and stress. Um, so don't there, I really don't feel like there are any pre-qualifiers whenever it comes to hiring somebody. I think that if you're wanting to do it on your own, QuickBooks is my favorite option. I think it's the most user friendly and it gives you the most clarity around the numbers. Um, but it also has its own quirks with trying to learn what that looks like. So on a very basic level, my biggest suggestions are to look at your bank account almost every single day, like add it into your habit stack, look at it every day. And the second thing would be just to pay attention to how you bring money in, where your money is being spent, because that will get, start to give you a lot of clarity around mm -hmm. the financials in your business. It's good to know. I thought I was OCD because I looked at my <laughs> bank account every day. No, I it's thought a I was great crazy. practice. I love oh. the word habit stack. Yeah. Yeah. I never heard. Of I've never heard either. that. What, oh. where, what does that mean? To give us some. I hope I'm not misquoting this, but I think it's from Atomic Habits. So habit stacking would be like if you have something that you already do every day, like brush your teeth, then check your bank account while you're brushing your teeth. Like your hands can do two things, right? Like if you're brushing your teeth, I don't know about you guys, but I get really bored when I'm brushing my teeth anyway. <laughs> so I don't know if anyone picks up their phone and scrolling or is mm -hmm. like wandering around or whatever you're doing, but that's a great time to check your bank account. And that would be like a habit stack. Or if you listen to a podcast in the car while you're driving, mm -hmm. that would be a habit. Like anything that you can kind of add on, or if you're going on a walk and you listen to a podcast, so anything you're doing and you can kind of stack a habit. I love that. Yeah. I think in the book they also talk about like if you have yeah. something you do every day, like drink coffee, set your medicine next to your coffee and whatever else you need to do so that when you drink your coffee, you just do the next things because they're all right there. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good book. Obviously, I forgot some of that. Well, and I, I do have <laughs> it um, on my nightstand. There you go. <clears throat> yeah, if I just read the books in my, I would never have to buy another book again for the rest of my life. Yeah, if I read is, the yep. books in my library. Yep, same. Yeah. It's why Audible is my jam yes. because I can like go for a run or go for a walk. If I try to read a book, I'm like, <clears throat> right. Yep falling asleep right in it. But I'm isn't it funny because I'll have a physical book and then I'll buy it on Audible because Same. I'll listen to it on Audible, but it'll sit on my bookshelf. Do you know or I do the opposite. I'll listen to it on Audible. I'll be like, I need I need to take uh, some notes on this, puppy. <laughs> so I had a friend who um, gave me a book called Start. I don't remember who wrote it off the top of my head, but she had read it and as she was going through it, highlighted things that she thought I would benefit from. Oh, that and then sweet. gave me the book as a gift. That's so thoughtful. Is that cool? Yeah. So then as I'm going through it and I'm reading, it's like almost like her relaying that sentence to me. Yeah. And it was it was awesome. I still have it. And I, I was that's why I buy Audible and the book, because I like to go in and then highlight them. <laughs> yeah, I love it. All right. You want to do rapid I fire? I do. Absolutely. Right, do rapid OK, fire. so favorite beverage. Iced coffee all the way. I love it. I'm going to tell you my secret recipe do it, when do we're it. done with please this. Please do. <laughs> oh, I'm so here. Yes, please. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, I'll tell you now. Yeah, I was okay. like, you're going to tell us? <laughs> okay, so what you do is you go buy Starbucks cold brew concentrate. Okay. You buy, it's Khalifa Farms. They have like this ice cafe mixer. It's a vanilla flavored mixer. Okay. And Topo Chico. So you get your glass, 16 ounce glass, you fill it with ice, you put your, fill it halfway through. I'm just I love like it. so excited. You, got, <laughs> you are like going to like freak out when you drink this. I'm serious. <laughs> So you do like your cold brew concentrate, you top it off with your creamer, just a little bit of creamer, or you can, a little bit more. And okay. then fresh open bottle of Topo Chico, you fill it to the top, you take a little hand mixer, mix it up. 
telling you, and it had. <laughs> It, it has to be Topo Chico. Don't be putting LaCroix in there and saying Aaron doesn't know what she's talking about. It has to be Topo Chico. And it is. it beats any, and I'm like addicted to Starbucks, any Starbucks cold drink ever. Okay, I'm I trying this tomorrow. my yeah. habit. I'll send you the links to the stuff. So yes, you, yeah, please do. Because it's a very specific Kalipa Farms creamer. Okay, that's what I need. Because I do buy the Starbucks concentrate. Yes. And I do have Topo Chico in my fridge. So yes. I just need the special creamer. It's at and Kroger. I'm I found it at Target the other day. So yeah. Okay. Okay, yeah. I'm excited okay. about it too. <laughs> um, the best advice, the best business advice you've ever been given? To just go for it and trust yourself along the way. I think sometimes we're the biggest people that hold ourselves back. And my mom is always, she's like, just do it. Just go for it. You got this. Just go for it. And so I always think that, like, whenever someone's struggling with something, if someone ever asks me, like, should I, should I do this? Should I start it? I'm like, yes. Just immediately, yes, do it. Do it. Mm. I love that. Uh, if you could have dinner with anyone, Ooh. Ashton Kutcher, he <laughs> <Or> do is... <laughs> tell. <laughs> he's like massively successful. Yeah. yeah, he's was my middle school crush. Like, just had the biggest, you know, like celeb crush on Ashton Kutcher. And now I just am so curious about his thoughts on business. He's just become a really successful investor, and I'm curious to know how he picks businesses to invest in, and just fascinated between the switch of what he was doing before and what he's doing now. Awesome. And then a like, what are you reading? Ooh, I'm reading this book called 101 Essays That'll Change the Way You Think. <gasps> I loved that book. It's so good. It's really I'm good. Read this one. Yeah. Okay. Like, yes. It's an easy. Every chapter yeah. is like something different, so it's a really easy read. So I'll usually read like a chapter in the morning, and it's really easy to get through. But it just has so many little tidbits of, like, like mind blow. Like just wow. Okay, that was that was good. And doesn't it make mm. you think too that you're like oh, I'm not the only one who thought this yes. or was feeling that this was, you know, happening, especially because totally. she talks about social media. Yep. And I always, I had my opinions about it, but never really wanted to share it. And it was someone validating it for me. So I was like, okay, I don't need yeah. to talk about it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, or maybe and, you do need to talk about it more since other people are feeling it and you were validated. That's, I mean, maybe yes. I need to hear it from you. <laughs> but I yeah. think also, you know, right. You got to tread lightly, right? Because <laughs> <laughs> everyone has a different view on on social media. Yeah. I think we all have the same view, but anywho's, um, <laughs> top bucket list item. I want to design and build my dream house like from the ground up. Like I want to like sit with an architect. When I was in college, I started out as an architectural engineer. Hmm. Really thought that's what I wanted to do and started taking like you have to take these kind of design courses and engineering classes and it was just because I really want to like design my own house like I want it to have the coolest stuff and I want to have just I just want it to be my own and so although architectural engineering was absolutely not for me <laughs> I would love to work with an architect and an engineer to to build my dream home I hey we can't it. yeah I I can't wait to see that happen yeah 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 someday another year and Penny, yep. Penny is going to fund the whole thing exactly I'll yep. come back on and be like listen I built the dream home <laughs> yeah and then you need a pretty penny yes like framed I love house. that yes. yes like where it starts yes this exactly. is where it all began yes <laughs> I love it well one more time I know we talked about it but if somebody wanted to get a hold of you learn yes. more about pretty penny where is the place that they go yeah so you can find me on all social media at pretty penny accounting you can go to heyprettypenny.com and there'll be information on there. It'll also link you back to my website. Um, but yeah. All right. We'll have all that on our notes page too. Awesome. So thank you so much thank for doing this. Thank you guys this. for Ash, having me. You. This is so fun. I appreciate it. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely.